Thanks. I'll get into my piece of wood. Um, yeah, this lecture is going to be slightly different from the usual reflective presentation we give. So normally we kind of go through a potted history of projects. Um, but tonight, I'm trying to mark the beginning of an exercise in sharing of transparency um, and of starting to try and make the knowledge and the resources that we've developed working as a collective over the past nine years accessible to others who are also trying to think in different ways about working through architecture. Um, it's also the first time that I've had family members in the audience, so forgive me if I get really nervous and start like burying myself in my laptop. Um, firstly, I want to talk... Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about the crisis. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the context in which we're working in, the context in which some of you may be about to start studying, um, or will be graduating into, or some of you are already practicing within. Um, the current culture that generates and forms the built environment also produces problems. So there's the stark financialization of property which runs in parallel through no coincidence with the increased homelessness and serious housing need. There's temporary housing providers, developing business models, creating good returns from the provision of totally unacceptable living conditions for those most vulnerable in society. And not least to say the building industry's contribution to carbon emissions, the warming of the earth and the global climate emergency. All these aspects compound inequality, both within our country and more broadly across the world, along lines that were forged by empire, slavery, and capitalism. Buildings in the form of the built environment have a kind of really powerful capacity to make things that are in fact only contingent or particular, so cultural, historical, political things, feel like natural conditions of the world, beyond our agency, unaffected by our decisions, like gravity, like water, like weather. Um, but it's important to remember that they're not inevitable and that everything is only contingent. There is a really intimate relationship between the speculative forces that generate the built environment and the architectural profession. And this can be traced back to the building of palazzos in early 16th century Italy started to valorize the surrounding pieces of land, which also coincided with the rise of professionalization of architecture. So architects can be tools and advocates for economic and political attitudes for building. And Architects give form to the nature of political orders. They are only one piece in the puzzle, but architectural thinking, as Eva kind of alluded to, this is at least what we like to think, has a significant role in the process of conceptualizing the scope and legitimizing a method of creating or changing the city. It's critical, therefore, that if we're to deal with problems of the current system, architects, architectural thought and energy needs to be brought to bear on how to change it. And in order to do this, um, my kind of provocation tonight is that we need to think about how the conditions of architectural practice itself also contributes to reproducing these orders. Um, so I wanted to start with a quote from the architectural historian Esther Choi, who asked, how might we, re how might we reorganize ourselves whilst we are embedded within the system and thus participate in it? How might we think of alternative institutions, more ethical modes of conduct and unseen opportunities to level the playing field a little bit more. In an economy and society that privileges individualism, privatization, privatization, oh my God, okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, of the commons, um, that is our social and ecological resources, as well as continual market growth. What does it mean to come together to think and envision a place collectively? For the first time in 40 years, in this country at least, architectural workers have started to unionize, to demand better working conditions and working culture, to organize as a discipline, to take a stand against some of the inequality and injustice compounded by the architectural profession through the development of the built environment. Um, the section of architectural workers are organizing to bring change to a working culture where there's a lot of precarity, sometimes a very intense workload, which has a huge impact on, on people's lives and certain communities more than others. So they note that 20% of architectural students are BAMES, black and, black and minority ethnic, but only 1.7% finished entire training to become architects. And that's a really stunning um, statistic which needs to be changed. Um, it feels like it's an important moment to reflect on how things can be different, not as an intellectual exercise, but as a productive effort. Um, so sharing practical ideas and organizational strategies to protect a varied workforce and a collective cooperative 
critical practice that attempts to dis desegregate ourselves from market forces and their intrinsic intrinsically driven beliefs about the value and nature of our work. Um, so I'm a part of Assemble. This is us. We're a collective who have been working together for the past nine years through a practice that is collaborative and mutually supportive. Um, we want to try and start thinking about how we can share our experience and learning, um, how we've organized and formalized, how we've made mistakes, how we've changed. Um, we're a group of 18, most of whom have had some degree of architectural education, though some of whom didn't. Um, we currently have one qualified architect in the group. And the type of work we've been able to make has been quite varied. We're interested in using design to make the day-to-day -day richer, more joyful, more various, to enable a city that can accommodate a wider variety of needs and ways of living, to enable it to be malleable and to support ideas and meanings we haven't yet and can't foresee. We're also concerned with how the social, cultural and economic violence and injustice, which are materialized, produced and reproduced in the built environment, can be in ameliorated, made more visible, or perhaps at our most ambitious and optimistic counted or even overcome. What we try and do is open up the city for people to experience a different relationship to their environment and through that then to, the, to each other. Space, spaces, social as well as physical ones, where people can witness their capacity to have a formative impact on the world around them, shape it to better suit their needs, ideas and desires. This has led to projects dealing with workspace, play, cultural production, housing, manufacturing and education. Exploring the gap between people living in a city and the forces that govern how it's made. We're interested in creating spaces where people have an active and directive role in collectively shaping and running their environments. Making space for contact between peoples based on cooperative cooperation, joint action and mutual help. We spend a lot of time trying to understand how things are made. And that's both in terms of manufacturing and construction, but also in terms of social structures and financial markets in order to consider how things might be different. We attempt to read political, administrative, legal, and financial systems through identifying their kind of effective symptoms on the form of the city, our projects, and our daily lives. Sometimes we design construction systems and material processes to enable ways of building that aspire to more than the final physical building itself, to create a social activity of learning and experimentation. Often it's an open-ended form of design physical structures that create opportunity for continued development, generating wider ownership, seeking multiple authors over any single one. Um, we're interested in questioning cultural hierarchies of value by refocusing attention on overlooked and under-acknowledged activities across a broad range of networks and situations. So projects and work are brought together in a variety of formats to create new forms of cooperation to build communities that are connected and have agency. And the kind of ongoing question and negotiation is how this is then realized, if at all, physically in different, for in different forms of architecture. Um, our practice aims to make place places which are more plural, mediate rather than remove conflict, more up for negotiation, more open in form as well as in meaning, and what I'll try to illustrate through the process of kind of unpacking different aspects of our organizational development is the extent to which the way in which we practice architecture is in itself also such a space. So one occupational hazard when working in a way that tries to embrace complexity is that you come up against false dichotomies, sometimes explicit, sometimes implied, sometimes taken for granted. But if you're not a straightforwardly commercial practice, then sometimes your concern, somehow your concerns are extra economic. That if you're not hierarchically organized, then you exist in an organic, free-form, ruleless state. That to be identifiable is to be internally coherent. That to make atypical decisions is to have a clear sense of a future you're working towards. And none of these things are, are quite the case. Our practice is very bureaucratic, concerned with cash, rife with internal contradiction and conflict. Most things which appear as strategy are, in fact, emergent qualities of, of contingent decisions. Um, and our administration of bureaucracy creates conditions that, in turn, produce opportunities and constraints, uh, kind of awkward insight, and also huge blind spots. Together, this has created our working culture, which makes some kind of work possible 
possible, even inevitable, and some kinds increasingly difficult. So over the years we've been working together, we've gone through an iterative process of managerial, financial and cultural evolution. I'm going to try and explain a little about how an interest in starting things from scratch as a process of learning has kind of led us on a really meandering path of social and financial relations. Um, so I'm going to start with organisational evolution. When we started working together, we were a group of loose associates, friends and friends of friends, most of whom studied architecture together, some of whom were picked up through the first project. And this is not to say that we were working in isolation. We had huge social capital, which is a very formative aspect of architectural practice. Um, we had close relationships from ex-tutors, really generous collaborative relationships with suppliers, support from some of our employers. MUF, Architecture and Art, for example, were... Uh, we, one of us was working for them at that point, were also a huge influence on us. Um, and the first project where we turned a derelict petrol station into a cinema really defined us and our interests as a group, though on, only through a process of post-rationalisation. So after it was all over, we tried to work out what had made the project so rewarding and successful and started to try and formalise on that basis. Um, at that point, we had no hierarchy, so aesthetic decisions were based on arguments around thriftiness, joy, accessibility, um, and we had to work through problems collectively. We had distributed responsibility, and we supported individuals to pursue their own interests. Um, we'd created a kind of scrappy DIY architecture of openness, bringing life to a London street using a combination of reclaimed and industrial materials. We were our own resource, and our knowledge, or lack of it, kind of defined the processes we, we designed through which we were able to reach our goal. Um, so, yeah, I guess this, the economy of kind of many hands, and by economy I mean that of all sorts of social knowledge-based, not just financial, and this way of using materials is something that we've carried with us, seeding a shared interest which holds us together. We've con con continued to kind of develop this in later projects through a focus on material provenance, a real interest in the aesthetic quality of the handmade, and kind of a champion championing of the legibility of the human hand in the creation of our built environment. The varied kind of constellation of design features and the social act of construction. Okay. The social act of construction that characterized our first projects was a reflection of the kind of loose collective organization we had. With evenly distributed authorship, no hierarchy meant that decisions, yeah, as I said, weren't made on based on taste. Um, or if they ha had they, in this instance they were based around arguments around no waste. Um, collectivity generated a kind of culture of energetic enthusiasm, a relationship to doing and making for its own sake, and the space, physical and financial, for people to experiment and explore, working for yourself but with a support system. So Cabinet Studio in 2012 was our first attempt at some kind of management structure. People often worked in residency, um, so based in communities or based on site running construction projects. We were very cheap then, so we could invest ourselves entirely in projects and learn through doing, and it was okay to be really inefficient. Um, the management process wasn't very effective, and there was no process of like, accountability. We, our finances were awful, and we had no understanding or appreciation of how we were spending our time. So then in 2013, the buddy system was, in, was introduced, uh, where all projects are led by a pair. And this means that project management, financial administration, though not bookkeeping or accounting, uh, but deciding on the approach, direction, and ultimately design um, is responsible for two people. Um, and this has been the kind of most enduring aspect of management in Assemble, and it's still in place now. It's supposed to guard people against working in isolation or getting overwhelmed or in trouble with projects. Buddies can orchestrate support from wider teams, which includes both people inside the office and outside the collective. And this allows for basically a kind of broad set of interests setting really different intentions on how to pursue projects. Um, as individuals were less able to 
pursue our own aesthetic and stylistic ideas, things are designed by committee. And as in a kind of traditional architectural practice, I guess we still, it appears that we have a house style, but it's produced in a very different way. Uh, so it's kind of complex hybrid of different agendas, um, more energies pushing in different directions to experiment, making it, making it a really rich process, I think. Um, yeah, so through Assemble, we're not really signing up for anything other than a methodology of the process of working together. We take on a lot more freedom to think about and question design than in traditional practice because we don't get siloed into developing expertise on one specific type of work or skill. And we move buddies so we like swap on different projects um, and have to continue to undertake different parts of different projects. Um, in 2016, we started a rotational management group as a way to try and cut down on internal meeting time. So we had 4M, which is the management group, which is composed of a chair, HR, um, responsible for resourcing and pastoral issues, new work who are responsible for administering and raising new opportunities. And then the idea is that every three months, one or two people would swap in. So you'd end up doing kind of nine month stint and then have a break from central administrative responsibilities. And it was working fairly well, but it did lead to a culture of like fine grain continual change, where every individual who came into a new role wanted to kind of totally reinvent it and um, make it their own. So the most recent version of ourselves is this, which is a fixed management group, um, which means that everyone's kind of assigned to different areas. So we have a group for practice, projects, communications, and estates. Um, within which you're then kind of allocated specific responsibilities and these are kind of set for the long term which should allow people to build more specific expertise, play to their strengths and interests and that's the plan at least. Currently it's still very new so we're still finding our feet. Um, I guess it's just to say that yeah refining the organizational structure is still very much like a live project and it's becoming increasingly apparent that that will probably be an ongoing one for as long as we continue to exist, catalyzed by people's changing life situations, their health, their familial responsibilities, and different financial pressures. Meetings, conversations, and communication are kind of the core work of any cooperative or collective organization, and we're no different. So we have weekly collective meetings, separate meetings for different management groups, quarterly management meetings, which is QMMs, what's up there? Um, which is mainly administrative, and then every year we have a summit where everyone goes away together, and that's meant to be less painfully administrative. Um, but this kind of rigorous structure has not always been the case. In fact, one of the most important pieces of work that we've undertaken as a collective is learning how to have a meeting. How do you work on problems collectively? How do you record information? How do you set agendas? How do you speak to one another? I think it's really stunning that for most architects and also people in general, though we may go through years of education, people are very rarely taught about the nature of having a meeting or the dynamics of how to hold a conversation, how to facilitate and support kind of collective interaction. And it's just totally fundamental to being able to work in the world. So I recommend that everyone has a go at learning how to do it. Um, Things like people who talk a lot are kind of giving themselves permission to speak and silence from others is a form of tacit consent that then reinforces kind of un unbalanced behaviours. So trying to learn that and also learning not to interrupt each other, that's a big, big learning curve. So Pan Assemble is the weekly meeting where we all get together and we discuss projects and try to work collectively. It's been running since 2011 and it started as kind of infrequent meetings in the pub or bedrooms through a phase where it was almost the whole day long and included a lengthy update on every project being worked on. It's been in the evening for a while, um, over dinner time, to allow members who are working in other practices or who were studying at school to join. Um, and was called Sweeps and Mops. Sweeps was supplementary weekly equitable e evening presentations and Mops was monthly open presentation. They're just like totally ridiculous acronyms. It's like absolutely no point. Um, it was, yeah, and then it's moved to breakfast time, and then since it's slowly kind of edged backwards into the working day. 
generally it's always been Monday or Tuesday and now it kind of begins, there's like an administrative update and then it moves into presentations like show and tell and then at the end we split into working groups focused on kind of working through particular problems in different projects. So it's like always meant to be have a productive focus where you can get different people who wouldn't be able to otherwise engage with the things you're trying to work through in a project. And it's really best for generating ideas, um, but it also allows us to kind of critique each other, and that doesn't necessarily create time for deeper thinking along the lines of those critiques, um, but it does mean that all of us are answerable to all the others, and we can hold each other to account. Um, and as there's no consensus around approach, we can hold each other... There's quite a fairly deep level of questioning is encouraged. Um, this doesn't necessarily make for easy conversations, um, but it is really the overlap and the tension between different layers of our actions, um, which gives the kind of richest and most rewarding kind of work. Work is not one thing or the opposite, but it's multiple and fluid, and there's no one answer. It has kind of different textures and saliencies at different times to different people. Um, this is just to illustrate our mild obsession with ridiculous acronyms. So our administrative meeting went from MMM, which was Monday morning meeting, to Monday morning management meeting, which became 4M. And now we've got the worst one, which is PUKE, which basically stands for Practice, Estates, Work and Communications, uh, which is the kind of aforementioned man management groups. In terms of cash, the first projects were all event spaces, so we kind of recouped costs from the sales of tickets and refurbishments, uh, refreshments. Um, so from the beginning of, the, of working together, we've always had this idea about kind of diverse income streams, affording some freedom to work, however misguided this is, affording some freedom to work in a different way, perhaps at a different pace, or to vary the types of patronage we can act to access. Um, our first office opened with a kind of public front, so we ran it as a pizzeria come architecture studio for a while, and it also had a brief spell as a music school canteen and a club. Um, and we were all meant to be paid for the days working on projects, but in actual fact, we ended up kind of subsidizing the cafe. So we had to make a change. Um, so we stopped the cafe, and then focus more on kind of design project work. Um, and as the number and diversity of projects grew, we, we started a tax system. This is the buddy system as well, um, where we were all working as freelancers basically under the name Assemble. And 50% of the design fee goes to Assemble in the central pot. And if you're doing a like construction project, which is like called a capital project, for those of you who are new to the architectural world of language. Um, there's higher risks involved with delivering those kinds of projects, so that involved 25% of the whole budget going into Assemble. And then when we, doing, when we were doing internal administrative work, that was set at a kind of flat rate. Um, but basically, that ran for probably three years, and we ended up in a situation where people who were doing other work to kind of supplement their income, so like starting a building contractor or doing teaching, were earning actually almost twice as much as the people who were doing the internal administrative work. Um, so in reaction to that, we introduced UBI, so Universal Basic Income, which ended up not really being a UBI at all. Um, it was intended to create a kind of base level of income through a higher tax, but when we actually came to vote on it as a group, we went for 100% tax on everything. Um, so basically it meant that every single piece of work you do that is in any way associated to what Assemble does, um, then it all goes into a central pot and we all earn the same flat amount. Um, so that's across all kind of 16 partners earning through the practice. Um, and doesn't apply immediately to recent employees, but historically their income has kind of been brought up to the same level after a year. Um, it's important also to note that rental income gathered through the management of our office, Sugar House Studios, has been like really critical to our financial solvency. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Sugar House in a moment, but just to say that workspace development and management is something we've been actively pursuing through new projects in Greenwich and, and Brixton, Fabric, Fabric Floor, which is the photo here, uh, recently opened. Um, the culture of our practice, I guess, is kind of is really defined by two main factors. So there's food, 
and Sugar House, which is the studios where our office is based. From the beginning, food has really played a pivotal role in the development of our practice, and it continues to be the thing that keeps our form of practice sustained in the form of a kind of daily collective lunch. Um, and whilst to some the, the word lunch simply denotes a break from work to eat, in Assemble, the kind of reproductive labour of creating food for one another is really fundamental to the social nature of the group. Um, it had its origins in the building of communal projects where lunch was really an essential break, an opportunity, an opportunity to refuel. And then in the second project, it became a communal responsibility when which each individual was responsible for feeding the collective on a kind of rotating system. And it's helped forge a practice developed around the social contract which the act of routinely feeding each other gave a kind of familial di dimension to, one of distributed care and mutual responsibility. Um, lunch is now organised according to the rules of a complex bureaucracy, so you get eight points minus for cooking. You, yeah, minus eight points for cooking and plus one for eating. So it's quite good because it balances out. So if you don't eat for a while and you're not in the office, then you're not going to just accrue loads of points. Um, and in other projects outside the studio, food has been a critical part of their realisation or process, from homemade ice cream, popcorn, pick and mix, food cooked over an open fire at the Adventure Playground we established in Glasgow, to shared barbecues and eating in the same place, which has also played a vital role in developing projects within certain cultural or community contexts, whether it be in Liverpool, Croydon, The Hague, or New Orleans. Often we consider the food and the means of its consumption to be designed as part of the projects alongside strategic or spatial concerns. And at the end of lunch in the studio, we play a game, which is fives, and the purpose of which has evolved from basically trying to get someone to do the washing up to now finding someone to make tea and coffee for everyone. Um, I guess that Assemble was, from the start, a social practice, and so eating together forms a fundamental part of that. And food and fives and the kind of culture around that break in the day have also created an opportunity at a kind of smaller scale um, with less repercussions than with projects for experimentation, risk and failure to be present and part of the daily process in the office. So Sugar House Studios has... Um, also been the arena for large, larger scales of experimentation and failure. Um, it provided us space to edit, physical fabric of a building, um, make mis um, and the first version of the studio was in a kind of light industrial shed near Stratford. Um, we had to pay very little rent in return for creating a kind of cinema and cultural amenity for the wider community. Um, so that was at least given to us by the OPLC, which doesn't exist anymore, has evolved into the LLDC. It was essentially basically an organisation looking at the development or along the fringes of the Olympic Park. Um, and incidentally, actually, our second project was also came out of Olympics money. So it's kind of a funny twist that actually we probably wouldn't exist if the Olympics hadn't have happened in London, which is a kind of, yeah, it's... Um, something to reflect on. Um, yeah, I guess our practice was a kind of in residency in this place. So we spent time building connections with other groups and organisations in the area, collaborating on programming, developing ideas for projects, thinking about how to address public space around Stratford High Street. Um, it, we tested out different iterations of, of built forms within the space and they kind of had evolving purposes and uses as the business model changed within them. Um, we learned a lot about adaptation and about how to do budgeting the wrong way around. Um, about around, uh, yeah, around about the same time that the first version of the space when it was pizzeria and cinema was failing, we met Workshop East, who are a collective of carpenters who recently graduated out of Building Crafts College. And they became a kind of key anchor tenants um, for Sugar House, totally fundamental to changing the nature of the space. And it became much more focused on craft production and making, um, and yeah, just kind of expanded from there, really. In 2016, we moved to Bermondsey and, and into an old college building. Um, 
having brought lots of our tenants and recruited new ones from Stratford, so we now have a wood workshop, metal workshop, ceramics studio, alongside music studios, fine artists. They're all kind of focused on around a core of common facilities, provi providing a collegiate way of working or a collective culture we've, which we've tried to advocate and create structures for in other projects. Um, and those are the kind of workspace projects that we're really uh, trying to support. Making spaces that have a particular focus. So uh, the one in Brixton has a textile focus and um, then the one in, in Greenwich is going to have space for kind of larger industrial processes. Um, but all of them are kind of attempting to replicate and build on the lessons learned from Sugar House. So they include a communal kitchen and a project space for education and public events. That the management of the space should also be done by a tenant, so the re relation to the space and its uses in a kind of more horizontal um, manner, has a more horizontal aspect to it. And again, to have a kind of t key anchor tenants, this is Steve from Workshop East, um, that sets the tone for the types of facilities that are shared for the rest of um, the studios. Um, as we were developing our own space and this, and having to address all these questions and learning positive things through a process of failure, essentially, um, we were thinking a lot about different business models and the space that the process and the spatial form of Sugar House afforded us to think about different ways of operating meant that we could start developing projects that thought about design not as just physical and material exercises, but also as ones that relate to kind of cultural infrastructure, um, supporting certain types of activity to exist and ways of relating to the built environment. Um, so this is Black Horse Workshop, which, was, um, which is a um, public access workshop space, um, an education space set up in Walthamstow. Has a kind of like tiered structure of um, a public space where people can come and go to the cafe, then there's like the professional, um, well, there's amateur access through like workshops and training um, programs. Then there's like another layer of professionals using the space. So it's a really nice way of kind of collapsing worlds into one physicality. Um, and that's been running for four years now. Um, and it's had an extension and we kind of sit on the board of that. The second organizational project, I guess, that was also a spatial and architectural one, was Baltic Street Adventure Playground, um, which was trying to think about um, children's relationship to environment where there's like lots of top-down planning initiatives happening. And on the scale of a master plan, this was happening in Glasgow, so there's, uh, it was a commission that came out of the Commonwealth Games. Um, and these kids basically were going to be having their childhoods kind of surrounded by huge amounts of hoarding and, and demolition. And so it was trying to think about a space that could stand in counter to that where they could have access all the time and they would have control and they could see transparently what was going on. Uh, so it's really an organization that has been involved around trying to create opportunities for the kids to continually have a say in how the space changes and how it um, will develop and continue to be edited by them over time. Granby Workshop is a kind of different kettle of fish. This is an architectural ceramics manufacturer that we set up um, in 2015, which came out of a kind of housing project in a um, neighborhood in Liverpool. And this has essentially been a kind of exercise and reflection on what it means to be a business situated in a community and to try and think about uh, aspects of community involvement and education, but also uh, ownership models that can transfer um, shares and uh, or bonds or um, other means of investment to the to the workers and to people who live in the neighbourhood. Um, and 
yeah, Grammy workshops have really been focused on trying to address this balance between our interest in craft and a and a capacity to produce things at scale. So trying to like still maintain an aesthetic that can be unique in each thing that it produces and is still being made by hand and that isn't hidden in the outcomes of the product um, but can still interact with machinery that is essentially produced for producing is essentially made for producing things that are all exactly identical so trying to like play with that tension um, I guess yeah so I've explained a little bit about oops, a little bit about our initial lack of internal hierarchy um, and how we had to kind of disrupt, we had to address, we had to create structures to address and disrupt arising hierarchies that just came out of other aspects of being and um, working in the world. Um, but again, these kind of most recent changes still need to acknowledge differences and I guess this is just the kind of continual challenge of designing spaces and designing structures that can be supportive and um, make change, but not prescriptive and afford difference. Um, in terms of like our governance and legal form, um, maybe this isn't really open day stuff, but I just thought I'd show it because it's quite interesting. The production of projects has also led to a kind of like trail of subsidiaries which take different forms um, be that manufacturing through Grammy workshop or construction and these are now kind of being invo uh, enveloped by a like partnership which will um, take ownership over all of those things beneath it so it means you can kind of continue to pursue like lots of different kinds of work but you still have a overarching legal structure uh, that ties you together our practice is really an act of kind of building, checking, and exploring our trust in one another, both in relation to the opportunities that come from collective work, also the responsibilities and accountabilities we have from each other. So it's constantly an act of, of balancing. Um, practice and work are behaviours that are scalable, and the principal characters of our internal interactions, based on cumulative value of varied and different voices, attempts to try and reflect itself through our projects. Um, and hopefully some of what I've described will, um, will hint at this, but for those of you who haven't started studying architecture, <laughs> um, the REBA kind of stages of work is a framework um, that we use here in the UK that kind of describes and sets out the process and levels of information that you need to produce at different certain stages in a project. And it goes from naught to seven, so from strategic definition to in use. Um, and I'd like, and I guess the kind of conceit that I'm trying to say with this slide is that we're trying to talk about an expanded form of practice beyond that. So from minus one, perhaps, to think about self-initiated self projects, identifying needs, uh, challenging assumptions, ma mapping resources, giving time to listen and just stay in conversation with communities. It's not just about kind of strategizing. And then at the other end of that, we also are involved in the kind of ongoing management of projects and be that buildings or um, other kinds of spaces. Um, so I guess the people in this room and in this building and more broadly, as a part of this association, have really influential roles to play in the development and evolution of the architectural profession. And we, I think, at this moment in time, all have a more obviously urgent responsibility to acknowledge that everything is interconnected. Our design decisions, our supply chains, the personal relationships and working structures we build, this is all the work. Every decision about how you build teams around you, formalize your working structure, where you locate your practice will impact the nature of the architecture that you produce. And unless we specifically make attempts to work in new ways that value things other than those made obvious or desirable through capitalism, we will continue to replicate current working culture, subsequently building in problematic assumptions to our practice and ultimately the architecture we create. So we need to start actively cultivating a really broad and powerful consensus 
that political solidarity and consciousness needs to be a part of the professional identity of the transnational architect. And we cannot continue to practice as we have before. We cannot conceive of ourselves as individuals extracted from the collective context of architectural practice. Um, we need to have a kind of sea change in terms of our like, professional orientation. And we need to both critique ourselves and challenge each other about the role that we perform in the current global crisis. Um, when, yeah, when we as, as those involved in the building industry, and this is going to be you guys, have influence on how huge quantities of money and resources and materials are being <coughs> extracted, moved and used. Sustainability, as it's described in the current situation, is not sustainable, and by taking no action in opposition to the problems our profession is complicit in, we allow them to perpetuate. Um, I guess, so, as kind of Ava allu alluded to at the beginning, um, in the past our practice has been kind of used to represent a celebrated mode of, of alternative practice, and it really at one point became quite tokenistic and I, and I want to, that obviously precludes real cultural change um, and it just typifies the alternative as one possible type in an attempt to contain it. And I think this talk and a series of conversations that are happening at this moment in time is the first step in a stand against that. Um, there are many other collectives, businesses and independent practitioners organizing in countless different forms, working all over the world to challenge the current way in which the built environment is developed, described, and conceptualized. Here is, there's some names of a few. Um, I have not included voluntary organizations, housing cooperatives, or land trusts, um, because I'm assuming this room contains people interested in earning a living working in the built environment. Um, some of these people are not architects, but are concerned with the creation of space or the culture of work. Some do not practice anymore. Some are well-known, some are only just starting. Um, and I wanted to leave this slide here during questions so that people have time to note down a few names and look them up later or tomorrow or in a few months or in a couple of years. Um, I guess this process of kind of expanding our, our, our learning from working collectively is um, going to be happening over the next year and we'll be publishing things online and hopefully physically as well. Um, so that will also that will include some of the stuff I've been talking about today, but also other management tools like contractual information and policies and terms and conditions, like things that will just help you do work in a way that is protected. Um, so yeah, get in touch with us if you're keen to find out more. Um, thank you for listening.